This is a box of unified minds from the Sun and Moon era, and this is a box of Chilling Rain from the Sword and Shield era. 31 months after its release, Chilling Rain is now selling for $158, but in March of 2022, just 31 months after its release, Unified Minds was selling for $334. Now what if I told you that this wasn't an anomaly, that Pokemon boxes released prior to the 2021 Pokemon production surge, averaging 257% more gains in their first two to three years of release than those released recently after Pokemon expanded its printing infrastructure. Let's talk about it. Hey everybody, what's up from Pokemon Classics, reminding you that the classics never go out of style. You know, I don't usually do these types of follow-up videos, but in this case I felt compelled to for a couple of reasons. One, I do feel like I should clarify a few of my statements and go into a bit more depth, but two, I have some additional data that I think is relevant to this conversation. Now, if you didn't see my last video, I was talking about the supply chain influx that we've seen in the last few years in Pokemon and some of the potential downward pressure that it could be applying to the market right now. Now, this affects pretty much all aspects of the market, whether we're talking raw singles or if we're talking graded slabs or even sealed modern product. I do think that the massive saturation that we're seeing will at least have some sort of effect on the prices that we're seeing. Now, I do want to address some misconceptions that existed in the previous video, and one is that I am not saying that the Pokemon market is doomed or that we're seeing the market uh, tapering off. I think it's still a very strong market, but perhaps less volatile than it's been in recent memory, particularly in the aftermath of the pandemic. One more thing, one more caveat to point out is that I do think boxes can be a profitable endeavor. I've never suggested otherwise, especially if you're buying in at a low price point. If you have access to distributor prices or you're buying wholesale upon release and you're getting it well under MSRP, it's a relatively low risk purchase because often boxes are going to retain some value if not appreciate over time. It just becomes a question of, are we going to see a longer duration than usual? And are we going to see similar returns to the past or are those returns going to be slightly diminished from where they've been at before? And those are the two takeaways that I would suggest is I think with all the additional supply that we will see both of those things, a longer duration of the hold for appreciation and then a smaller return on it. But that's just my theory. Again, it's a theory. I welcome your guys' comments down in the comments below. So let me know what you think about this data. Let's dive into it. All right, so what I wanted to do in this video was sort of a then versus now comparison, taking a look at some of the appreciation of different booster boxes, both prior to the pandemic boom and the sudden supply influx as Pokemon rapidly increased their production numbers, as well as some of the boxes immediately thereafter. So the range of these metrics are going to come from boxes released from 2018 and then onward. It's also worth noting that the metric, the timeline that I'm using is between 20 and 40 months after release, so we're looking at about two to three years as our measurement. And the reason for that is I was able to glean some historical data from a news article looking at the exact prices of some of those older Sun and Moon boxes. So we'll be looking at ones going as far back as Lost Thunder in late November of 2018, and then up to Rebel Clash, which was right around mid-year of 2020. And then we'll be comparing that with some of the more recent sets and how they've performed up until now, through that same time duration of 20 months to 40 months. Some of these correlations are pretty shocking, and I should mention that these are just correlations, it's not causation. So there may be other factors at work here, but still, I think it's worth considering, particularly for those that are more casual investors in modern sealed product. But the first thing that I wanted to point out was how well all of these older Sun and Moon boxes have done in that first two to three years after release. In fact, if we take a look at Rebel Clash, after 22 months, it was selling for $202. And if we assume a distributor level box price of about $90 per box, that's a 124% appreciation. Now we could go then to Sword and Shield Base, which was selling for $250, 178% appreciation, and just down the board. The lowest one happens to be Rebel Clash, which more than doubled its value in under two years. And the best performing box being Team Up, which is a great set and a really cool concept, but that box was selling for $754, or about 737%, in just a little over three years. Taken as an average, this era of boxes before the production boom was pretty significant. 
We're looking at an average box price here of $399.29 and an average return of 343%. Again, this is just over two to three years. And I'll be the first to say this is kind of surprising to me since I'm not a sealed box collector or investor myself, but these are some pretty shocking numbers. That's a very good return. And so I can understand why a lot of people are attracted to sealed box investing. However, when we look at more recent sets, these numbers and metrics change a bit. Now, 2021 is the year where Pokemon really went all in on its production. Really, it was more in late 2020. And so these are some of the sets that we saw releasing immediately thereafter when the numbers were just going astronomical. We're talking over 3 billion in 2020. And then going into 2021, that number increased to over 9.1 billion cards produced. And then the following year, Pokemon one up themselves once more with 9.7 billion cards produced. And I firmly believe that that level of saturation is going to suppress the appreciation of some of these boxes, at least in the short term, probably in the midterm, maybe even in the long term. That remains to be seen. But anyway, we've taken sets that were released as far back as 40 months ago with Vivid Voltage, all the way up to Astral Radiance, which is the one that pairs up closest. It's not 20 months exactly, it's about 21 months. But still, if we take a look at these numbers and the appreciation difference, it is noticeably different, noticeably less than some of those earlier sets. So for example, we can take our lowest performing box in this list, and that's gonna be Battle Styles, which for better or for worse, if it's not a set that uh, is particularly well loved amongst collectors and players, we're looking at a 9% appreciation. Now, I should also offer this as a caveat. Here I'm using a $100 price point for investing in boxes. I assume that the MSRP is a little bit higher in this era for a lot of these boxes, and so would be the distributor prices and the wholesale prices. Now the best performing box here that does stand out as an outlier is obviously Evolving Skies. There are so many great single cards that are of value in this set that it makes sense that this one would be priced a little bit higher. So after just 29 months, Evolving Skies is winning out here with $474 being its current box price as of late January of 2024. So in that time, that was a 374% appreciation. All of the others though, fall under 100% and really under 60% for all of these different boxes over that same exact timeline. The average price, if we add all these together, is $186.57 per box, which is less than half as much as the previous ones over that same 20 to 40 month duration. In terms of the average gain, we're looking at 86% over that same timeline, which is only about one third of the gain from those earlier boxes. And then finally, if we were to drop out Evolving Skies from this equation entirely as an outlier within these sets, we're looking at just 39% appreciation for all of these sets over two to three years. So I guess the question is, what happened? The way I see it, one of these three things has to be true. Either Sword and Shield is a worse expansion than its predecessor, Sun and Moon, or demand has suffered in some significant way, or perhaps an over-increase in supply has suppressed the prices down. And personally, I think it's the latter of those three. It's also worth noting that most of these sets were produced in 2020 to 2021 as part of that initial 3.7 billion card production run, and maybe some of the reprints coming as part of that 9.1 billion production run in 2021 to 2022. But the true saturation, the true wall of production isn't really represented in the data yet. We'd see those more at the tail end of the Sword and Shield era, as well as going into the Scarlet and Violet era. So we might have an even greater saturation still entering the market. Now, of course, it is also worth considering some of the hidden costs that come along with selling cards of any kind, whether they're graded slabs, individual singles, or in this case, booster boxes. But when you're dealing in collectibles, there's always going to be some risk involved. And so that risk is something you wanna factor into the equation when deciding whether or not the returns are worth the level of capital that you're putting into these types of investments. There's also some of the expenses. If you're going to be selling cards, there's going to be a variety of seller fees, whether it's on eBay, TCG player, there's supplies, there's shipping, there's computer ink, all those types of things are also going to eat into that margin. And if that margin isn't large enough, well, then maybe the risk is no longer worth it. Now I will say the returns are still pretty strong, and even if they're not as strong as they've been in the past, you know, it still might be a worthwhile play, specifically for those that are able to understand the market and have an easier access point uh, than some of the casuals out there. So I'm not saying it's a bad thing, I'm just saying it's something to consider.
So anyway, at the risk of rambling too much in this video, which I really only intended as a follow-up to the previous video, let me offer you my takeaways. The first is, does supply saturation really impact prices? And I think it certainly can, and in this case, I think it is, at least to some degree. Now again, it's just a correlation, and there may be other factors involved as well. And if you can think of any that I haven't considered, definitely let me know down in the comments. I view these as more of conversations, as discussions, rather than an argument. If you enjoy Pokemon in any way you want, whether it's running a business, flipping Pokemon cards, investing in Pokemon cards, engaging in the competitive gameplay, more power to you. I love the diversity of Pokemon, so I don't see this as an adversarial thing. Secondly, can booster boxes still be profitable? Well, I think so, and we're seeing that on the daily, but I do think that it's perhaps prudent to temper expectations, and how you choose to optimize your situation is going to determine how much potential profit or gains there is to be made further down the road. Because in my mind, the road is paved a little bit differently now than it was prior to the pandemic, and a large reason why is the saturation. So personally, I think you should expect to see a bit more of a duration, a longer duration, holding some of these cards, some of these sets, before they make any sort of meaningful appreciation, at least comparatively to in the past. But then I think you should also consider uh, the possibility that there could be less appreciation, as well as more competition among sellers who are looking to replicate the exact same process. Those are my takeaways. You can take them, you can leave them, you can argue them down in the comments, but I look forward to hearing what you have to say. Anyway, guys, I'm Pokemon Classics, reminding you that the classics never go out of style. And until next time, everybody, stay well, have fun enjoying Pokemon however you choose to. That's my takeaway. We'll see y'all with the next one. Bye, everybody.